All right, good morning. Uh, it's 11 o'clock. We're going to get started here. I'm Thomas Bowles, the Ag Extension Agent here in Prince William County, and today's topic is going to be on pesticide safety for the home gardener. As always, if you have questions, please put those in, in the chat box and we'll get to those at the end. Um, so let's get started. So first, a little bit about Extension. If you're not familiar with Extension, it's a partnership between uh, the federal government, state government, and uh, localities. And our mission is to take unbiased research-based information and get it out to the public. And so here in Prince William County, we have programs in agriculture and natural resources, um, financial education, parenting, 4-H youth development, and financial I'm forgetting one. Uh, oh, and nutrition. So if you have interest in any of those and have questions of any of those, please let us know. Um, just a disclaimer um, that Virginia Tech does not endorse any particular product, but any uh, brand names that are mentioned are here for illustrative purposes. So what we're going to look at today is what is a pest, what is IPM, what kind of controls are out there that we can use, and talk a little bit about pesticides and pesticide labels and how to read those. There we go. Um, so what is a pest? A pest is anything that is undesirable or causes injury or harm to people, property, or the environment. Um, it's important to realize that some things are pests in some situations and not pests in other situations. For example, uh, caterpillars tend to eat our vegetables. Um, however, when they become butterflies and moths, they are pollinators. So um, it's important to keep that in mind and to keep in mind that uh, just because something looks like a pest doesn't necessarily mean it is a pest. It's important to identify it. So when we talk about controlling pests, we need to understand or ask ourselves some questions. Now, how important is this problem? Is it really a problem? Is it worth controlling? Is whatever it is causing an annoyance or is it causing serious damage? Are there health and safety issues to be considered? And how much are you willing to tolerate? So a pet, we, urge people to control a pest only when it's really causing or is expecting to cause more damage than is reasonable to expect. And you think about um, an ecosystem in nature that is functioning, there is damage from pests, but it is kept in check and there's balance. Um, as someone pointed out in the chat, caterpillars are 94% food for baby birds, and so even though they are a pest in one sense to our uh, plants, they're also bird food. So um, you can, if you can accept a little bit of caterpillar damage, it's helping to promote the ecosystem to function as it's supposed to. When we talk about pest control, um, we talk about IPM, or integrated pest management, and it's really a process that we use to figure out how we're going to respond to pests. And the basis of IPM is, is first to scout for pests regularly. Um, learn the usual suspects. If you're growing certain plants, those certain plants have uh, common pests or usual pests. They may have, there are some that they don't see very often, but know what those usual pests are. You know, if you're tomatoes, for example, aphids, hornworms, those are typical pests that we see on tomatoes. Know what they are, know what they look like, know what their life cycle looks like. So you can go out there, scout regularly, and when you can see them and control them before they become a big problem. Also, learn the beneficials that are in your uh, garden and landscape because you don't want to kill beneficial insects. When you think you have a pest problem, you need to identify what is actually causing it. A lot of pests can have similar signs and, and symptoms, and if you treat for the wrong pest, you're just applying chemical for the sake of applying chemical, and it may not do anything uh, 
to what's actually causing the problem. Again, it's important to determine what your pest control goals are and if you really even need to control product, the problem. For example, we have in this picture a hornworm caterpillar with lots of little rice-like things coming out of them. These particular rice-like things are actually cocoons from a type of wasp that lays its eggs in the caterpillar. Um, once they hatch and go into their larval stage, they feed on the caterpillar a little bit. The caterpillar itself stops feeding on plants, um, and then they spin these little cocoons and then hatch from them. Um, so if you've got a lot of caterpillars that look like this, nature is taking its own course and controlling it for you naturally. These caterpillars aren't feeding, and so there's no real need to control them. It's also important with IPM to understand what control tactics there are available to, to the pests that you're trying to treat. Um, so you know all your options and can pick the best one. It's important to evaluate the benefits and risk of each tactic or combination of control tactics. To, again, to see what's going to work best for you and what's going to do the least harm to the environment. We want to choose strategies or start with strategies that do the least amount of collateral damage or potential collateral damage, and then scale up as we need to. There's an excellent video on our YouTube uh, channel that talks about being a garden detective. It's focused on vegetable gardening, but it's true of any part of the landscape on how you go about um, scouting and researching what pests you have and what the options are to deal with it. So when we talk about pest control options, we have natural controls and we have applied control. The natural controls are the things around us in the environment that will control the pests naturally. Our friend, oops, back, backwards here. Our friend, the bracted wasp, who's laying, laying eggs in caterpillars, that's an example of a natural control. Nature's taking care of it for us. And natural controls are things like natural enemies, as I just mentioned, the climate. There are some pests that we may get, but our climate may be too far north for them to survive the winter, and we may not get them every year. Ecological balance helps keep most pests in control if you've got a balanced ecosystem. Unfortunately, a lot of times our lawns, gardens, and landscapes are not complete ecosystems, and so there isn't that balance. Sometimes geographic barriers will work, um, although insects have a way of getting around those. Our friend the spotted lanternfly, as shown here, is native to Asia and hitchhiked its way to Pennsylvania um, on decorative garden rocks. And so um, now it's a problem in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia. Also, the amount of food, water, and shelter that's available can help control uh, different pests. But these things are pretty much out of our control. Applied controls are the things that are within our control, things we can do um, to affect pests. And there are a whole list of them, and we'll talk about each of them uh, individually here. And the first is host resistance, and that is using plant species or cultivars that are tolerable or tolerant of certain conditions and certain pests. Um, a lot of times you see this in tomatoes. You'll see if you come over to the picture here, this is a chart of resistance code. You are ordering seeds. You'll see the tomato, the variety, and possibly some of these letters after them. And that means those are the things that they are uh, somewhat resistant to. And we breed plants so that they are resistant to resistant to some of their, uh, their biggest disease problems. Now, it's important to understand when we're talking about breeding plants for disease resistance, there's a difference between uh, genetically modified plants and hybrids. And people get kind of worked up about uh, GMOs or, or genetically modified plants. 
Um, it's important to understand that a hybrid is just a plant that's two. We've taken two varieties of a plant and we've cross pollinated them. We've manipulated who the parents are going to be for that new plant, but we haven't really done anything to its genetics other than that. Um, with GMOs, we're talking about going into the lab and changing the DNA, DNA sequences in those plants to give us a desired result. GMOs, generally speaking, are not available to the average person in the public. Uh, there are only a certain number of species that have GMOs that are legal in the United States, and these are available to the ag industry and not the average person. So you really don't have to worry about, if you don't want GMOs, you really don't have to worry about that if you're buying seed, uh, unless you're buying from a, an agricultural supplier, and even then, there are only a handful of species. Um, sweet corn is probably the only thing that people would grow uh, that you might find a GMO variety for. We can use biological controls, and this involves us releasing natural enemies to control a pest. And they might be parasites, they might be predators, they might be diseases. Um, the problem with biological controls is that the amount of control varies a bit, and it, there's usually a lag between when you, say, for example, you release ladybugs to, to deal with your aphid problem, there's sometimes a lag between when they actually start making a difference. And generally speaking, our natural biological controls are not going to fully eradicate the problem. Uh, another thing we can do biologically is release sterile males of the problem insect, and that way we're eliminating or greatly reducing uh, the next generation of that pest. And we can use pheromone traps um, to monitor what's going on and to trap uh, undesirable insects. Probably the most famous pheromone trap are the Japanese beetle bags. Um, it's really a good idea if you're using a pheromone trap like that, that you put it in somebody else's yard. <laughs> um, those pheromone traps are really good about bringing in the problem insect. And so if you have them in your yard, that's where the, the problem insects are going to go. And so some of them will go into the bug bag and some of them will go into your plants. So probably the thing we have the greatest control over is how we grow our plants. And these are the cultural controls that we can use to manipulate the growing conditions to make, uh, make a better environment for our plants so that we can reduce pest numbers. And there are lots of ways that we can do this. We can rotate crops, um, particularly when we're talking about vegetables. There are certain families that uh, have a lot of pest problems, and if we rotate them to different areas, then we can break the pest cycle. Um, a lot of times, for example, you'll see the tomato family um, rotating with the bean family, rotating with um, the brassica family, and other families on a four or five year cycle. Sometimes we can lightly cultivate the soil to help reduce weed problems. Um, we can vary the time of planting or the time of harvesting to affect when that plant is going to be mature enough to handle uh, its typical pest. So for example, if we can start some plants early, they'll reach a point of maturity where they can fend off pests better than if we plant them at the normal time. Um, we can also harvest some things early, uh, although depending on the plant, that's, that can be tricky. We can also plant trap crops, and a trap crop is basically a crop that you plant with the idea that that crop is more uh, attractive to the pests that you're trying to deal with than the crop that you're growing for yourself. And so most of the insects, for example, will go to that trap crop, and you can deal with them in that trap crop and reduce the damage that you have on your, the crop that you actually want. And a good example of that is Hubbard squash. For whatever reason, squash bugs really love blue hovered squash. 
not a lot of people in the U.S. eat blue hubbard squash. Um, so that makes an excellent trap crop when you're growing other types of cucurbits. The important thing is you need to go and deal with the pests on that trap crop. But the idea of the trap crop is to try and concentrate those pests so it's easier to deal with. There are other things that we can do to help. We can adjust the row length or row width, excuse me. And with some diseases, we have problems when the plants are too close together. There's not enough airflow. The leaves don't dry out. Um, and so adjusting that row width can sometimes help. Proper pruning and thinning can also help reduce pest numbers. And fertilizing at the right time can also help. We do have to be careful with fertilizing because if we over fertilize or fertilize at the wrong time, we can actually bring pests in um, because they're attracted to that tender new growth. It's important when we're talking about cultural controls to grow plants um, and focus on their natural rhythm. The more that we try to shape the plant growth pattern to what we want versus what the plant wants, the more we stress the plant and the more stressed the plant is, the more likely it is to get a disease or be attacked by insects. And so we can do things like build our soil health, we can provide nutrition that's going to match the growth cycle of the plant. For example, we don't want to fertilize uh, shrubs in the middle of the summer because we've got a lot of tender new growth um, that may not harden off before the winter. And that tender new growth in the fall is going to be attacked by uh, certain pests. Um, we don't want to over fertilize, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we want to, again, fertilize the plant when the plant needs it, not when we think it needs it. So, for example, you know, a lot of times we, um, a lot of people are on the Scots fertilizer plan for their uh, turf, and they're applying it four times a year, once in the spring, once in the summer, and twice in the fall. Well, if you have cool season grass, Cool season grass wants to go into dormancy in the summertime, and so pushing it to accept fertilizer and pushing it to try and grow in the summer is overstressing that, and you get more problems. For example, brown patch um, with that instead of fertilizing it in the fall when it really wants to be fertilized. And of course, providing adequate water. And this is a thing that with trees especially, trees and shrubs, we see this a lot. People don't water, in times of drought, people don't water their trees and shrubs. And while trees and shrubs are fairly re resilient, a lot of times they will suffer the effects of drought a couple years down the line. So we get calls all the time about, oh, my trees having all these problems and come to find out nobody's watered them over the drought in the last few years. And so they're suffering from drought stress, and this is what's causing their problems. And so generally speaking, most of our plants need about an inch of water, less whatever rainfall there is, per week. Um, and if you have a specimen tree or um, you know, shrubs that are there, showy shrubs that are in front of the house, you want to make sure that they're adequately watered. And here I'm going to throw a shameless plug in. Uh, we have a program called Best Lawns. Um, Best Lawns is set up to take, um, take the information that we have on you know, what weeds you have, what is your soil composition, um, what your management goals are. Take a look at that. We, we do soil sampling. We write a nutrient plan that's custom to your lawn. Um, we also give control recommendations where they're needed, um, and we come up with a system that works with the lawn so that you hopefully are reducing your fertilizer inputs and reducing your pesticide inputs and having a healthier lawn. And if you're interested in our Best Lawns program, please contact Natalie Walker, who's our Best Lawns coordinator, at nwalker at pwcgov.org. Another tool in the toolbox 
is our mechanical controls. And this is using equipment or manual action to disrupt pest life cycles. And this can be something as simple as a row cover, uh, as shown here in the picture. Uh, a lot of times with our brassicas, this time of year we're putting out our brassicas, we put a row cover on it. And that row cover is there to keep uh, cabbage moths from coming and laying their eggs and having cabbage worms affect our brassicas. We're excluding them with mechanical controls. Other types of mechanical controls would be fencing, plastic mulches. We can also do disruptive operations like plowing um, and light cultivation with hoes and disking. Sanitation is another tool that we have, and this is typically um, something that people overlook. Sanitation is one of those things that's kind of, sometimes it can be a double-edged sword. So um, if you have diseased plant material, you definitely want to get rid of it. By the same token, sometimes we want to leave some of that leaf litter um, at the end of the season going into the winter. Uh, because we want to provide shelter for beneficials. Sometimes in doing that, we also inadvertently provide shelter for pests. And so it kind of depends on what pests you have as to how much you want to reserve, how much you want to remove and how much you want to keep. And when we talk about sanitation, generally when we're talking about urban industrial pests, I'm thinking of things like cockroaches and grain beetles. Uh, it's a matter of improving cleanliness, removing places they can hide, um, or sealing places they can hide, um, and increasing the, the frequency of garbage pickup. Uh, for agricultural and garden pests, we're talking about removing crop residues, and we're talking about decontaminating equipment, animals, and other things as we go through the garden. It's important to think about if you are pruning a diseased plant, you want to clean that tool before you go on to the next plant, otherwise you're spreading. By the same token, if you've got an area that's got brown patch in your lawn and you're running equipment over it, so you're mowing it, um, you can spread that brown patch to another part of your lawn if you don't clean the equipment in between that, which I know is a pain, but it does help reduce the spread of disease. Finally, we have chemical controls. When all else fails, there are chemical controls. Um, this is typically the control of last resort. And chemical controls include all pesticides, whether they're synthetic or organic. And we always recommend that we can use the other tools in the toolbox before we get to chemical controls wherever possible. Um, I know there are a lot of people who are against chemical controls, but it's important to understand that it's a tool in the toolbox, and just because it's in the toolbox doesn't mean you have to use it all the time. And we don't recommend using chemicals all the time. So when we decide that we are going to use a pesticide, we need to use the pesticide that's appropriate for the pest. You don't want to use a fungicide on an insect problem because you're just putting pesticide out there and it's like you're dealing with it, for example. We want to target the pest when it's most vulnerable. We want to target the pest using the labeled rate. You don't want to overapply pesticides because that could be dangerous to the plant, it could be dangerous to beneficial insects, it can be dangerous to humans, and it can be dangerous to other things in the environment. It's very important whenever you're using a chemical control organic, synthetic, whatever, that you read the label and you follow the label. It's also important that you wear personal protection. Whatever the label says is the minimum personal protection, that's what you should be wearing at the very least. And again, it doesn't matter if it's organic or synthetic. Both are poisons, both are potentially dangerous, so you need to protect yourself. Another thing to think about is who should actually be applying those chemical controls. Is it simple enough for you to handle, or do you need a professional? If you're spot, excuse me, if you're spot spraying weeds in your lawn, maybe you don't need to call a professional. If you're treating your tree for disease, and you've got to be spraying stuff above your head, maybe it's time to call a professional who may have the equipment for it, 
and the personal protective equipment. Um, so think about that when you're thinking about, okay, I've decided to use a chemical control. Do I really want to do it? Um, most of our pest control uh, professionals have specialized equipment. All of them will have specialized knowledge um, and all of them will should be certified. So if you hire a pesticide applicator, make sure that they're certified, licensed, insured, and also discuss the treatment plan so you know what they're going to do. One of, one of my beefs with uh, some lawn care companies are they're going to come in and spray. They're going to do a weed application or yeah, a weed application, a weed control application, and they spray, but they won't tell the clients what they put down. As a client, you should know what's being put down so that you understand what it is and what it will or won't do. There are lots of types of pesticides and pesticide is really a generic term. And it includes things like insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, rodenticides, all sorts of sides. Um, but basically these are all poisons. And it's important, again, to pick the right pesticide to deal with the problem that you have. There are lots of different types of pesticides in terms of the way that they act. And we'll take a look at some of those. Um, first of all, they're in, when we talk about herbicides, they're pre- and post-emergent herbicides. And a pre-emergent pesticide means it's going to act on plants that have not yet germinated. And typically we see this in combating crabgrass. The best way to deal with crabgrass is to have a thick, high cut lawn. The second best way to deal with crabgrass is to use pre-emergent. Kill it before it becomes a problem. Um, the trick with pre-emergence is you have to apply them at the right time in order to stop that germination process. Post-emergence are herbicides that we use once things have already sprouted. And most of our herbicides are post emergent herbicides. We also have selective and non-selective pesticides. And selective pesticides are targeted at a species or a group of species. Non-selective or broad spectrum uh, pesticides kill a wide variety of things. And so, for example, Bt, which is a bacteria that kills caterpillars, um, kills caterpillars. It doesn't affect the protein receptors in humans, in bees, and other wildlife. Conversely, bifentrin kills all sorts of things, good and bad, including bees, as well as um, having negative effects on fish and other aquatic life. So where possible, we want to choose a selective product to minimize the potential for damage. Again, we want to use the, the product that causes the least harm. And here are just some examples. Uh, if we look at, at herbicides, you know, lysophate kills broadleaf and grasses, and so it's going to harm any plant it touches. Whereas something like fluazepop is a granicide, it will kill grass, but it won't kill broadleaf plants, or 2,4-D and MCPP, which kill broadleaf weeds, but they don't kill your grass. So one thing to note about herbicide selectivity is unfortunately, ortho has decided to expand its Roundup brand. And Roundup used to be glyphosate. And, and right now, uh, the, only Randa, uh, the, only Randa, the only Roundup product that has only glyphosate as its active ingredients is the Purple Tops Roundup Super Concentrate. So what does that mean for a consumer? That means that you have all sorts of, whoops, this is slide here. Um, you have all sorts of Roundup products that may or may not have glyphosate in them or have glyphosate with another active ingredient in them. And depending on what you want to kill, 
that could be a good or bad thing. And so it's really important to know what the active ingredients are of the product that you're going to use, and if that active ingredient is going to kill the pest that you want it to kill. With pesticides, we do need to be um, a bit concerned about our pollinators, um, particularly with insecticides, but with all pesticides, uh, we want to be cognizant of uh, our beneficials. And so we want to ideally use products that have low toxic toxicity or no toxicity towards um, our beneficials. There are lots of tables. This is a, this particular table um, talks about some different insecticides that you can use uh, and how much or what their contact toxicity is in terms of if it hits that, that particular insect, will it kill it, um, and how long it lasts in the environment. And so, again, when is, we're thinking of using something that's going to do the least amount of harm, our first choice, if possible, we want to use something like BT, which doesn't really have a toxic residue, um, versus something like imiclopred, when it's, it's um, a high contact toxicity, it does um, kill bees, there should be a comet there, it also kills beneficial predatory be beetles, and it does kill nectar feeding parasites. Um, so it's important that we make sure that, again, we're picking something that's going to do the least harm. Some ways to protect bees. Um, if you know that there are beekeepers around, talk to your beekeepers, um, notify them that you're going to be spraying some stuff and just let them know. Uh, again, choose the insecticides that are least toxic. Don't, impl don't apply insecticides to crops that are blooming. Um, think about the wind, avoid drift because you don't want the wind to blow that toxic stuff someplace that you're not targeting and try and apply either late in the evening or early in the morning because bees aren't active during those times. Also remember that bees are not the only pollinators. Um, there are lots of pollinators and if pollinators are foraging, that's not a good time to spray any type of pesticide. We also have uh, pesticides that can be uh, systemic or contact-based. Contact-based is basically if it contacts it, that's where it's going to do harm. Systemic, you spray the pesticide, it translocates throughout the plant, and it kills the whole plant. And if we can't compare the two, uh, we can look at a product like Burnout, which is clove oil-based. It's an organic. Um, it's really good at killing the tops of plants, but it's not very good at killing the roots because it can't contact the roots. As opposed to something like glyphosate, which we can spray on the leaves, it translocates throughout the plant and it kills the whole plant. And we have the same sort of situation uh, with insecticides. Most of our insecticides are contact insecticides. We spray them, the pesticide touches the insect that we want to kill and it kills them. Um, there are some systemic ones like imidacroprid that can be drenched. Um, the tree takes it up, and then anything that tries to feed on that plant is going to get some of that insecticide. I got a lot of questions about organic pesticides, and I want to talk a little bit now about the difference between organic and synthetic pesticides. As I mentioned earlier, both are poison. And it's important that you treat both of them the same in terms of thinking through what level do I want to use to treat this, what's going to do the least amount of harm, and still get the action that I need. And also think about them in terms of they are, they are both potentially harmful, so you want to wear protective equipment with both. Generally speaking, synthetics work faster. 
Uh, most of our organics are contact pesticides. Um, most of them are broad spectrum. Both can harm non-target -tar species if they're used um, inappropriately, and both must be applied according to label instructions. Also understand that just because an organic pesticide has an ingredient that may be available over the counter doesn't mean you can use that over the counter product as a pesticide. You can only use things that are labeled as a pesticide for pesticide applications. So for example, one of the organic pesticides that's out there is vinegar based. That doesn't mean that you can go to Walmart and buy a thing of vinegar and pour that on the weeds as pesticide. There are two problems with that. One, it's not labeled as pesticide. And two, uh, the strength of the vinegar is significantly different. Um, so you may not get very much actual um, effect in using over-the-counter stuff. So let's talk a little bit about pesticide labels and what's on a pesticide label. All pesticide labels have identifying information that include the brand name. And so in this example, we've got Ortho's Weed Be Gone Max. It's got an ingredient st statement down here that's really hard to read in this picture and quite honestly, usually really hard to read on the label um, that will either have the chemical name or the uh, common name. And so this dimethylene salt to methyl for etc. is really 2,4-D. And so a lot of times they'll just put 2,4-D. Um, but things like 2,4-D, triclopyr, dicamba, those are common names as opposed to the long chemical name. The pesticide will list the active ingredients with its percentage by weight. It will list the active ingredients and then inert ingredients. And the inert ingredients are there to help it stick the plant or um, the carriers to spread it, those kinds of things. Unless they have negative uh, impact, they're not going to list out what those active ingredients are. Um, so in this example from our Weed Be Gone, um, we've got 2,4-D, triclopyr, dicamba, and most of the actual product by weight is inert ingredients. There are going to be two EPA numbers on the label. One is the registration number, and that is the number, uh, that is that product's chemical number as registered by the EPA. So the EPA knows exactly what product that is, which is important if there's a spill or, an, or some other type of major accident. And then there's the establishment number, and that just says, uh, what site, what factory actually manufactured that particular product. Um, establishment number, we usually don't worry about unless there's a recall. Registration number can be helpful if there's a, a poisoning issue. Speaking of poisoning, precautionary statements are common on all uh, labels, and these are signal words that give us an indication of potential hazards. And they range from caution, which is relatively low hazard, to warning, which is moderate. And then we have danger or danger slash poison slash uh, skull and crossbones. The difference between danger and the danger poison or the danger skull and crossbones is that the danger poison means that there is a high, it is highly toxic through multiple routes of entry into the body. Danger usually means that there's only one route into the body where it's really highly toxic, if that makes sense. The other thing you'll find in the label is directions for use, which makes sense. It tells you where to apply it, how to apply it, how much to use, how often you can use it, if there's a wait time between uh, when you can use it and when you can reapply it. Um, if there's a wait time between when you can use it and when you can then seed, 
Um, it can tell you how to handle it, which is things like mixing and loading, those sorts of things, how to dispose of it, and other do's and don'ts. When in doubt, if you can't find that information on the label itself, call the customer service line. So understand that a pesticide label is a binding legal agreement between the EPA, the manufacturer, and you. And so all three are required to do things in a legal manner according to the label. So the company has a very vested interest in you using your product correctly. And so if you can't find the information you need on the label and you call them, my experience is they're extremely responsive and are very quick to get you the right information that you need. So if you can't find something on the label that you need, call the customer service line. They'll be happy to help you. As I just mentioned, the label is the law. It's a binding agreement. Um, generally speaking, they're not going to be a whole, don't have that many inspectors, and so they're not going to be running after you. Oh, you use this incorrectly, but we still want you to use it correctly according to the label. Um, remember that pesticides may not be applied to any plant, animal, or site that's not listed on the label. So if, for example, you have a product that says it's used for lawns and you want to use it in your vegetable garden, you can't do that unless the label says you can also use it in your vegetable garden. It is also illegal to apply pesticides at a rate higher than what is on the label or to use it more frequently than what's on the label. And a lot of times people uh, will look at a, a product, they'll get a concentrate, like our, uh, our friend, the super concentrate glyphosate whoops, here. And they'll look at the label rate and they'll figure if X amount is good, maybe double that is better. And they'll add more than label rate. And what you end up doing is you end up applying more pesticide than you need for one thing. And you run the risk of doing collateral damage. The other thing that people will do is they will spray stuff and the plant won't die immediately, and so they spray again. It's important to, to look at the label and see what those wait times are. And know that in the commercials, they show, I've sprayed it, and whoop, it dies. That's not usually how it happens. Usually it takes a little bit of time for that pesticide to get to the whole plant and that whole plant to die. So give it time, follow the label. So if you've used the product, why should, you know, for years, why should you legally? Well, directions change. Sometimes the actual uh, ingredients change. For example, uh, with Weed BD Max that we looked at earlier, it often it's 2,4-D, dicamba, and a third ingredient. And that third ingredient may be triclopyr, it may be mecoprop, it may be something else. And that can switch depending on which, uh, which factory made it. That can depend on the time of year. And it can depend on the availability of that third pesticide. So you may be using, I've always used Weed Be Gone Max, and it's always done a great job on X weed. And then all of a sudden, it doesn't work on X weed because that third uh, chemical isn't effective on that, that, that set of weed. So it's really important that you under, understand that labels change. Um, so you want to make sure that you've got the right chemical. You want to make sure that you're applying it to the proper application site because research is done. And sometimes they allow for new sites. And sometimes they reduce the, the sites that you can use a particular pesticide. The application rate and timing may change, again, based on research. Um, and the safety precautions may change. So it's important, even if you've used a product for years and years and years, to make sure that you're looking at the label. Again, the label is the law. And again, when in doubt, call a customer service line. Again, they're very helpful. Um, I've, never had, I've never had to wait more than probably 10 minutes to get an answer. 
um, when I've had questions about what we live in. And usually it's a direct line and not one of those, pick one if you want this, pick two if you want that. Um, like I said, they're very responsive because it's very important to them that you follow the label correctly. Other thing to consider when we're uh, using pesticides, pesticides and fertilizers for that matter, um, when they're left on impervious surfaces like roads and sidewalks, they'll get washed into uh, storm drains, they pollute our waterways, we'll have algae blooms, um, we can have fish kills. Uh, so it's really important to sweep up any product that lands on an impervious surface um, and dispose of those according to label instructions. Remember that pesticides do move in the environment. Um, a lot of times we have issues with drift. We have dr issues of too much water on a pesticide and it being washed through the soil or washed onto an impervious surface. Um, we apply too much pesticide and get a little bit too much rain. Um, we can have it go into our groundwater and we don't want to spray pesticides within 50 feet of a well as an extra safety bonus, because you don't want to be drinking pesticides. Understand that some pesticide products will need a light watering or light rain to activate. That doesn't mean to soak them, it just means to apply a light application. And you don't want to apply those products right before a storm, because that storm will wash those products into the storm system and into our water. We want to avoid applying on windy days because of drift. Um, you know, our sprays will, volatile, will uh, volatilize, they'll be carried on the wind, and they can do damage on um, other crops. And it's really important that you keep that in mind. Um, I've been to apple orchards where they've gotten damage from pesticides that were sprayed in nearby blackberry fields. And they were sprayed on windy days, and that pesticide drifted over into the orchard, and the orchard trees got damaged because of it. Try not to apply on really hot days. The hotter it is, the more likely the spray will volatilize and move up in the atmosphere, get caught on the wind, and drift. Also, if you're spraying under trees and it volatilizes, it will go up and it will affect trees. We see this in landscaping quite a bit where we're applying weed killer around the base of a tree. The weed killer volatilizes because it's broadleaf weed killer when it reaches, goes up and, and reaches the leaves of the trees because they're broadleaf plants also, and you get tree damage. So it's really important to read the label. Um, the label is going to tell you not only what temperatures to store the product at, but also they'll give you a temperature range of when you can apply it. And you don't want to apply it when it's too cold or too hot. Again, you want to identify problem and make sure you apply the correct control. I put this slide in, in this because last summer, I got called out to a farm. And they had all this damage on their trees. And these are walnut trees. And they couldn't figure out what happened. And come to find out, you'll notice the utility lines here. The utility company wanted to be proactive. It wanted to kill the invasive Alanthus trees on its utility lines and its right of ways. So they went to the right of way that's on this farm and they sprayed. They sprayed herbicide on these walnut trees, thinking it was Atlantis because they didn't identify correctly the pest. Melanthus and walnut can look very similar. Um, and so again, this is a good example of why make sure that make sure that what you think is a problem really is a problem and that you you have the right guilty party um, before you think about applying controls. A bit about personal protective equipment. Um, a lot of people are really casual about personal protective equipment, um, but it's really important that you're wearing 
personal protective equipment. And then minimum PPE for um, low toxicity products is a long sleeve shirt, long pants, socks, and shoes that are chemically resistant. If you're wearing something like leather boots, that leather is going to absorb pesticide. It's going to soak through the, le the leather, soak through your socks as you sweat and get in your feet. And that's not a good thing. You want to make sure that any clothes you use is PPE, you wash after each use, and ideally you wash those separately from your other clothes. You want to use gloves that are chemical resistant, and if the label calls for gloves, it will tell you what kind of gloves to use. That's important because the, not all rubber gloves are the same. Um, you know, sometimes it's a nitrile glove, sometimes it's something else. But it's really important that you have the right glove because some of our chemicals can go through some different types of gloves. Um, and again, you don't want to get splashed with that kind of chemical. Consider wearing more safety equipment, especially if you're mixing or loading. And if you're mixing a product, maybe you want to wear some sort of face shield or eye protection, you know, just in case. Um, you can't go wrong with too much PP. You can definitely go wrong with too little PPE. Here's an example of what not to do. Clearly, these guys are not paying a whole lot of attention. They are definitely not applying whatever it is they're applying according to label instructions. They're not wearing the correct PPE. Um, don't be like these guys. When we think about chemicals, a lot of times we think about chemical spills to our skin. But chemical can, chemical can also get into our bodies through oral contact, that is swallowing, or inhaling chemicals. Um, and typically, our signal words are based on the most toxic type of exposure. So if, for example, there's really high toxicity if you inhale a chemical, but not a whole lot of toxicity if it's taken in orally or dermally, it's still going to be danger is going to be your signal word because it's going to be labeled based on the most serious effect. A thing to think about with dermal exposure or skin exposure is that typically we call the forearm our base um, in terms of, of absorption rate and everything else we base compared to that. And if you look at the different parts of the body that are listed here and what their rates are um, relative to the forearm, you can see that you know, depending on where you get pesticide depends on how quickly and how much of it's going to be absorbed into your body. Um, you know, a lot of times we'll be spraying pesticides and we're sweating and we'll put the forearm to wipe our brow and we just moved pesticides into our forehead area and made it really easy to be absorbed. Um, the groin is especially expo exposed to uh, high absorption, um, which is why you really don't want to be sitting down when you're mixing chemicals uh, to avoid that kind of spill. But be understand that, that different parts of the body absorb things at different rates, um, and we want to protect all parts of our body to make sure we're not absorbing chemicals. Pesticide storage, um, they all have specific requirements. They should be stored in a place that's dry and not likely to get flooded, a place that's got good ventilation, good temperatures uh, that are constant rather than fluctuating. Um, and always keep them in the original container that's got the label. And when we dispose of pesticides, we want to dispose them according to the label. Um, there are landfills that will take hazardous waste. There are hazardous waste collections every now and again. Um, but the best thing to do is buy only the amount of pesticide that you need. Um, you can find pesticide recommendations in Virginia Home, Browns, and Animals Pest Management Guide. Um, you can call your local VCE office 
for uh, instructions on, you know, okay, I have this pest, how do I deal with it? But in the end, remember to utilize your, MP, your IPM, scout, identify, and then decide if there's a problem and then deal with it with the least amount of harm. And then read all of your pesticide labels and follow those directions. With that, I will take questions. Oh, here's some resources for you, um, which we'll send off when we send out the uh, video. And any questions you have, I'm happy to answer on pesticides. I know I went through a lot quickly, but um, I'm happy to clarify. Do we have anything in the chat? Yeah, Thomas, there's one that um, about do container gardens uh, have fewer pest and disease problems? It depends. Um, container gardens can sometimes have more problems with uh, things like root rot if they're not watered properly. Um, a lot of our pests that fly in as opposed to uh, soil-borne pests will still find containers. Um, but like, for example, vegetables in potting mix, or excuse me, tomatoes in potting mix are much more, much less likely to get disease um, because a lot of our tomato diseases are soil-borne diseases and you don't have that uh, because the soil is mixed, potting mix, it's not inoculated with uh, those diseases and so you don't have as many problems that way. Other questions? The other, only one in the chat. Does anybody else have any questions? You can unmute or you can put it in the chat if you like. It is 12 o'clock though. And oh, wow. Almost. By quickly. Um, if you do, like I said, if you do have questions, you know, contact, uh, contact us. My contact information is there. Um, contact your local VC office. Um, we're happy to give you as much information about pesticides as you, as you need. Um, we can probably give you more, more information than you want. Um, thank you all for attending. Um, next week, um, next week, I believe Leslie Paulson is presenting. Good bugs, bad bugs. That's right. Good bugs and bad bugs. And then the following week, we'll be talking about the spotted lanternfly. Um, again, thank you all for having come and visited with us and we look forward to seeing you again. Have a great week, everyone. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know with your questions, comments, and suggestions for other classes. For more information on lawns and gardens, contact the Extension Horticulture Help Desk at um, mastergardener at pwcgov.org. Thank you and we hope to see you next time.